I got it on. Good morning. <laughs> News of this thing. So for those of you that are here in person, those of you that are watching online, we are so thankful that you have joined us this morning. Thank you for honoring us. Thank you for honoring God with your time. So if we can pray, please, first. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the time that we get to come together, that we get to worship and fellowship in your house, Father. Lord, I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be open to receive whatever it is that you want to say to each of us. I bind up every spirit of hindrance that would keep us from hearing your still small voice this morning, Father God. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for each person that is here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So today we're going to talk about three words. We're going to talk about prospective, we're going to talk about position, and we're going to talk about direction. So perspective is the way that you view something, right? Position is your relative standing or it is your rank. Direction is the course along which somebody moves or a path that somebody takes. The perspective alters your position and your position alters your direction. Whether you choose to look at things through God's eyes or you choose to look at them through your own will alter the position in which you stand. It will demonstrate whether you're standing on the rock or whether you're standing on sinking sand. If you're looking inwardly, you're going to fall, right? If you're looking at God, you're going to stand. It demonstrates who you are and whose you are and whether or not you know it. The position in which you are standing will determine the direction that you move, especially when things may not be going as smoothly as you would like. Your direction demonstrates whether you're trusting your ability to lead you or God's. What you think about and what you focus on, your position and direction are affected by it. So whether you're looking inwardly or you're looking upwardly, where you're standing and the way that you move is affected by it. So that's where you begin. If you are focused inwardly on what you can do, let me tell you that's a very small sun that you're trying to orbit around because God is much bigger. How you choose to look at things will demonstrate whether you have a greater relationship built on faith and trust on you Or God. In order for you to choose God's perspective, guess what? You got to know Him. You have to know who He is to you, and you have to know who you are in Him. It is then that you're able to walk by faith and you're able to trust Him. The perspective that you choose to look through sets the course for how you walk through any situation, whether it's your finances, stuff with your job, your kids, your church, relationships, whatever it may be. Where you're looking affects all of that. The enemy wants you to look inwardly instead of upwardly. He wants you to look through your self-perspective rather than God's because an inward perspective leaves you feeling defeated. And let me tell you, God says you are not defeated. You are undefeated. But in order to take and gain that victory, you have to have his perspective when you're walking through anything. Your position is based on whether, you, whether or not you know that God is who he says he is and he will do what he says he will do. That comes with spending time with him and it comes with having a relationship with him. There are over 100 verses in the Bible where God promises to never leave us or forsake us, where he promises to lead us and equip us with whatever it is he calls us to do. He promises he's there with you. He's going to give you everything that you need to do the task. So why would you not trust him? Why would you think that you could do it better? In Isaiah 41.10, he says, Do not fear anything, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Be assured that I will help you. I, the I is God, not you, the I is God. I will certainly take hold of you with my righteous right hand. It is the hand of justice, of power, of victory, and of salvation. Never doubt his presence or the fact that he is with you to guide you each step of the way. Following Jesus and saying yes with complete faith and trust is allowing him to order every single step that you take. Let me tell you, it is a deep dive into an everyday adventure that you will not regret. It is is letting him take over and you say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. There are a lot of scriptures containing promises to God's children, but there is a key to unlocking them. They don't just happen. That key is obedience. Some examples, Psalm 34, 9 through 10. Honor the Lord, all his people, for those who obey him have all that they need. Even the lions go hungry for lack of food, 
but those who obey the Lord, they lack nothing good. Psalm 33, 18, the Lord watches over those who obey him and trust in his constant love. The Lord takes care of those who obey him, and the land will be theirs forever. Psalm 37, 18. Proverbs 16, 20, those who listen to instruction, which means being obedient, following direction, will prosper. Those who trust the Lord will be joyful. And we are supposed to walk through everything with a joyful heart because we're trusting in the one who holds everything, right? While there are many more, notice that none of these say if. If you understand. If this makes sense to you. None of them say if. There's no if. There is you do this and I will do this. That's it. God's ways are higher than ours, and we are not always going to understand the why before what he asks us to do. But being able to move forward obediently with God leading you, unlocking his promises, requires you to know your position in him. It is then that you have faith in his word and you have trust in him. But that only comes from relationship. When you view things through God's perspective, you will understand your position in him. When you know your position, and we're going to go over this and over this so you get it. When you know your position, you know your calling and inheritance as a believer. When you know all that God has for you, all his promises to you in his word, you will then walk confidently in the power and authority that Christ intended for you to walk in. He did not intend for you to walk around with your heads down being defeated. He wants you to walk upright and straight, knowing that no matter what comes at you, he's got you. So let him have you. Quit trying to hold on to you. You're not your own to begin with. You might own your own decisions, but you're not your own. So the question for you today is, do you trust God? Most people, they say, yes, absolutely. I'm the passenger, God's in the driver's seat. Right? That's what you hear people say. I wholeheartedly believe that to be true and that to be true until God starts leading you into a difficult direction or a situation you don't want to walk through or he tells you to go talk to somebody you just don't like and you don't want to say nothing to him. That doesn't matter. He told you to do it. You do it. That's it. He might lead you to a crazy idea and Lord knows I have had several of those journeys. And it is then in those moments that you understand how much faith and trust you actually have in him. A rubber band isn't much use unless it's stretched. We may not achieve the fullness all God has for us unless we're stretched by him. So you can't stay in this little perfectly circle, right? So the more times you use a rubber band, the bigger that it gets. So if you've been stretched, you've been used by God. But if you're still like this, it's because you're focusing on you. In Philippians 3.14, Paul says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me. Paul sees himself being stretched by God so he can be all that God created him to be and experience all that God has for him. God has amazing things for you to do, each and every one of you. Whether you're here, you're online, he has amazing things for you. He created you with them. But you have to choose to want them and to, and to want to walk through them. It's not always a peaceful journey because you can't be stretched when nothing's going wrong to stretch you. He didn't say we weren't going to have trials and things, right? But it's our attitude while we're walking through them. We have to be willing to go beyond our comfort zone. We have to forget what's behind and press on to what's ahead. We have to let go of our fears and focus on what we can be if we allow God to direct our steps. Stretching means trusting God and surrendering that wheel. Yes, you are the passenger. Don't say it. Mean it. God sees the bigger picture. We don't. The confidence in which you quickly move when God gives you a direction demonstrates to the enemy your level of faith in the one who's ordering your steps. He knows. He knows. The enemy knows that the the more strength that you have in God, the more faith and trust that you have in him, oh, there's mighty power coming out of you, and then he backs down. 
But as long as you walk with your head down, he's like, I got them. I got this. We don't want him to have nothing. And John 15 and 5, Jesus says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. The enemy wants you distracted. He wants to get your perspective off whatever you are walking through or facing. He wants you to get them off of God and onto you. So you're walking through something. You're focused on God. God, you got this. I trust you. I know that you have this. And the enemy sends a little distraction. Whoop, shift. And then your eyes are off of God. They're on this distraction. And the enemy can intervene, right? We had no matter what happens, we go, no, no, no. In the name of Jesus, back down. I ain't got no time for you. You speak to it and tell it. You don't want to lose your position and lose sight of your position and who God is. You can shift from standing on the rock to sinking sand like that. The enemy wants you to forget that you are seated in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father, Ephesians 2.6. The enemy wants you to forget that according to Romans 8.17, you are an heir with, of God and a co-heir with Christ. The enemy wants you to know that when you change your perspective, your position changes. He knows when you change your perspective, your position changes, and then you walk in all of the authority given to you. Our legal position Standing with God. How quickly are you responding to God's voice? Do you know him well enough to trust him? So I asked you, do you trust him? But the follow-up to that is, if you don't know him, of course you don't trust him. You don't know him. How can you trust somebody that you don't know? If someone you just met and have had only a few interactions with calls you and asks you to go somewhere that you've never been into unfamiliar territory, how likely are you to respond, yes, let's go? If you don't have a relationship with them, you might not respond that way. They would probably be considered more of an acquaintance. But what level of trust are you going to have them to lead you? You're probably going to be more apt to look at yourself to be a better guide because you have a better relationship with you than you do them. But on the other hand, if it's somebody that you know, you've known them for some time, you've been through thick and thin, down in the valleys, up to the mountaintops, you have endless conversations, someone that you have a true relationship with asks you to trust them and follow them on an adventure into unfamiliar territory, then your yes will probably be a resounding yes because you have relationship with them. The same thing with God. You have relationship. Do you see the difference? I have a captain friend in Florida. Captain Dave. I have to tell him to watch this later because I'm talking about him. A few years ago, he wanted to take me swimming with the manatees in a bay off the Gulf. Let me tell you, first of all, these feet, they don't like to go in water where I can't see the bottom. That's just, let's just put that out there. If I can't see the bottom, these feet don't want to go into it. There might be something that are swimming around that might bite me, they might sting me, whatever. No, thank you. Not only did Captain Dave want me <laughs> to go into water where I couldn't see the bottom, but there were other things swimming around, and there were giant manatees. And he wanted me to get into the water. Some of them were bigger than me, and he said, oh, they're just gentle. <laughs> I don't think so. But they were big. But I had relationship with him. So I knew that I could trust him. He wasn't going to lead me into a harmful or a bad situation. I was blessed with an amazing memory-making day that day. And I had God downloads that I still have not put all of them together. Once I got in the water and under the water. Was I nervous? Oh, yeah. Was I shaken? Yeah, but I did it. Don't let the enemy rob you of all of the great adventures that God has for you. Trust him to lead you. Decree with me, Lord, I want to experience everything that you have for me. I don't want to miss a thing. We got too much life to live, y'all. 
Trusting God to lead you and guide you comes by having the relationship. It's not a relationship that you can build with a small conversation here or there 20 seconds over dinner. That's not relationship. It's built on commitment. God will put you where you need to be to release what he gave you to carry, but you have to confidently trust him and say yes. That confidence can only come with having relationship. God has led me to hotels to stay at because there was someone that needed to be prayed for, up hiking trails and down even when I still wanted to go up because I hadn't taken the pictures I wanted to take, to pray for somebody on that path. He has taken me to non-picturesque scenic views. Well, let me stop right there. Do you realize that there are some states out there that do not understand the word scenic view? Can I just go there for a minute? But no, pull off at the scenic view. I know there's nothing on the other side, Lord, to take a picture. No, you pull off because there was somebody waiting that needed his touch. And I got to be the vessel. Everything and everyone is on his radar and his map. We have to trust the driver. Choosing to look upwardly, trusting the one who promises to never let you go, saying yes when he asks you to follow him through doors that he is opening. Let me tell you, that is the hinge that will change your life and the lives of those that you encounter. Every day is an adventure with Jesus, if you will allow it to be. The end of last July, I embarked on another adventurous trip. <laughs> that had more twists, turns, ups, and downs than any that I had been on. I encountered so many obstacles and situations that would have easily altered my perspective had I not been walking in relationship with him. So from the start, the quick synopsis, the start before I left Texas, the passenger door decided it didn't want to open. Then I got up to Virginia. Passenger window decided, went down and decided it didn't want to go back up. Three-hour delay there, I could have said, you know what, Lord, this is it. I'm done, you know. So we go to, I get the, at the glass place, they take, and they put it up with Gorilla Tape. And the guy just happens to give us an extra piece. Okay, so kept the extra piece. Then was in New York, ministering to somebody on the side of the road. All excited, pulled off. There was a church. I, I rolled down the window to take a church. Anybody want to guess what happened next? The window wouldn't go back up, hence the other piece of tape that God knew that I would need. <laughs> Got up to New Hampshire, spending time with family. My grandmother's turning 100. We're having a good time. I got stung by a bee. Y'all, I'm allergic. No EpiPen. I had the red lines going up my arm, arms swelling up, and I'm standing there praying in the spirit and also talking to them at the same time. I ain't got time for you, devil. In the name of Jesus, you backed out. I mean, I was praying everything that I knew that I could because there was no way I was leaving where God put me and listening to the distraction of the enemy and going to a hospital. I ain't got no time for that. You're my healer. Fix it. You've got to have those conversations. Got back to Virginia. I had <laughs> I have, there's a sweet friend that I have there that she has an apartment that I get to stay in when I go and visit, and I absolutely love her. Could have stayed on. I went to bed that night, and I ended up with an abscessed tooth. Are you kidding me? All night long, I'm praying in the spirit, took and got up the next morning. Well, it just so happened that I had established relationship with a dentist right before I left Texas, which don't understand. I saw him, and then I left. What was the point of seeing him? Well, the point was, I need an antibiotic, please. I took one, one antibiotic. And everything went away. I didn't have to take pain pill, nothing. But that two-hour delay that I had allowed me two ministry appointments that I was going to miss because I had somewhere else that I needed to be. God ordered my steps. Get into West Virginia. Let me tell you, West Virginia has the most overachieving mountains I have ever seen in my entire life. And ended up on the side of the road. And then on to Kentucky where I was stranded for an extra few weeks, and my husband was very eager to get me to come back home. <laughs> As I sat on the side of the road in West Virginia, in the curve of that mountain, so there are no guardrails. Like, you're going up, you twist, you turn, no guardrails. And all of a sudden, the car decides, it doesn't want to go no more. Like, I mean, foot's on the floor, it does not want to go. It is shaking, it is fussing at me, it is telling me, and I'm telling it what for. And all of a sudden, there's no place to pull over. There was this one area that you could pull over on the side. Pulled the car into it, praying that nothing was coming at me because you couldn't see around the corner. 
after everything else that had happened, then this, I could have chosen to throw my hands up and say, that's it, I'm done. I could have put aside the engagement that I was headed to, all of the ones after that. Had I not who, known who I was and had my eyes not been on God, my direction may have changed. There's a scripture in Habakkuk 3. Y'all follow me on this. It says, though the fig tree does not blossom and there is no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive fails and the fields produce no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there's no cattle in the stalls, yet I will choose to rejoice in the Lord. Nothing's going right, but we're going to choose to rejoice in the Lord. I will choose to shout exaltation in the the victorious God of my salvation. You can be in the midst of everything. What is it? What is the chicken little? The sky is falling, but you choose to rejoice because the sky is falling. He has made my feet steady and sure like my hind feet. It makes me walk forward with spiritual confidence on high places of challenge and responsibility. Because my faith and trust were grounded and rooted of him with lots of praying, I joyfully could go forward for him to bring me through. When Holy Spirit told me, to just keep driving. So on the side of the road, I got out, and I'm like, all right, now what? Lifted up the, okay, the only things that I, the last time I was up here, I just learned to check my oil, right? So the only things I knew how to do were, let's make sure the gas tank is closed, and, let, and let's make sure there's oil in the car. The only two things I could think of. They were both fine. I'm like, I don't know, I don't know what this is. The Holy Spirit says, keep driving. I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. I'm going to need you to confirm that. Because he loved me, he did. All of a sudden, this broken down pickup truck comes pulling up. These two hillbillies come out. Kid you not. One of them doesn't have an arm, right? The other one, I mean, their clothes have seen better. Like they were, that you're, you think about your two true country hillbillies. These guys were it. Ma'am, what's the problem? Well, so then I go through everything and I tell them what happened. You know what happened? Oh, just keep driving. I said, what did you say? So I said, just keep driving. And I said, well, let, let, me, let me just tell you about the conversation I just had with God. One of them had a big cross on his necklace. And I told him, he said, well, we were just sitting down on the front porch, and God told us to go up the road, and there was a blue SUV that needed us to tell them to just keep driving. When you have your faith and trust with God, God will show up and show off every single time in your life if you're looking to him. So I drove. I was like, okay, we can do this. But that last leg of the trip would have taken a very different turn many times over if I hadn't trusted him and kept driving. If I had just given up, tried to get a hold of Johnny, because there was no cell service. (laughs) Tried to get a hold of Johnny and said, I need a tow, but I can't tell you where I am. I'm on the curve of a mountain in West Virginia somewhere. That would have been all I could tell him, because the GPS system had been lost. I knew where I was headed, so he could try to backtrack it. Every day we face opportunities to trust him, but the choice is ours. Our willingness to trust him and allow him to order our steps opens doors for God to bring us through and for us to have a testimony of his faithfulness. He can lead us to the desert because he knows he will meet there. Pulling off that road shoulder in West Virginia, I knew where I was going. I knew my destination, but I had no clue how God was going to multiply my time there. I had no clue that I was actually being led to a desert, but he knew who I was meeting there. I had to keep my eyes on him and trust him, stand on his promises, and allow him to direct my steps. Adventuring with Jesus is better than any roller coaster ride you will ever get on. A lot more fun, too. Not Well, a little bit scary, but not not as bad as the twists and ups and downs ones. I don't like those. You persevere through the tests and trials, the raging fires, the rising waters, by having the correct position and perspective. It's then with faith that you confidently march forward following God's direction. When you're held in the arms of the one who created you, knowing who he is to you and that you can trust him, you're able to confidently and in obedience go in that direction where he leads you. And guess what? He's got some gold waiting there for you. Not real gold. He's got gold, the stuff that's more precious than the actual metal. When you're driving, you're focused on a destination. You have a route, you know how to get there. But what if that road is blocked or you encounter a detour sign? If you're in unfamiliar territory, you may be hesitant to move forward or you may want to choose to retreat. 
The same is true in our walk with God. If our eyes are focused on him, we're walking in the direction that he's sending us. But what if all of a sudden he shifts your direction and say you're headed to Tennessee and you end up in Alabama? Instead of going to the store, he tells you, I need you to go to the gas station. What if you don't know where that is or how to get to the particular one that he wants you to go to? You know how to get to the store. If you know who you are and who he is in you, then you have a relationship with God built on faith and trust in him. And you can continue moving forward in the direction he's leading you, even if that direction changes because you trust him. Okay, Lord, we're going to the gas station. Just here you go. You take the steering wheel. How do I get there? God is the best navigation system you could ever have. GPS, God's positioning system. In Pennsylvania, there's a Grand Canyon. I was so excited. There's a Grand Canyon in Pennsylvania, y'all. I was so excited to see the view. I put it in my Google Maps, and before I knew it, there I was at the bottom. (laughs) Maneuvering through the roads, I was most certain that they were not meant for Esther. They were more meant for four-wheelers and four-wheel drive vehicles. (laughs) But my perspective was not the view that I wanted to see. I'm like, Lord, I wanted that to look down here. You know, you go over these rocks with a big rock, and you're like, okay, do I need to get out and move that one so I can pass it? Those are the kinds of roads I'm talking about. But from God's perspective, he had a message for me at the bottom that I couldn't have gotten at the top. Sometimes you have to be at the bottom looking up to appreciate the view from the top. So at the top... He rerouted the GPS, which he does. He takes over my GPS, the car radio, Johnny will testify. He takes over all of it. He didn't take it over. He led me to the bottom. He let me get to the bottom. But then he led me to the top so that I could see the view looking down. And when you're at the top, I saw exactly where I had been. You could see the road that I was on. Message received, Lord. Sometimes the straightest line between A and B is not the route that God chooses for you. Even while keeping your perspective through God's eyes and confidently heading in the direction he's ordering, your steps trusting means that if he suddenly changes direction, there is a purpose for it. I promise you. He doesn't do anything without purpose. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, God tells us, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Just because the direction changes doesn't mean the destination does. My destination didn't change. The direction did in getting to the destination did. The destination is always in the center of God's will. When God takes you on a divinely ordered detour, trust him. Seeing through God's perspective, positioned on his promises, moving forward without knowing the outcome, trusting and believing that God has your best interest at heart. You have to trust him. He doesn't want anything bad for you. He's a loving God. He's not going to take you to somewhere that you shouldn't be. Pulling off that shoulder, I still had four hours to go. And we got there. We found out that I did it on one cylinder, which I don't really know what that means, except it doesn't have power. That's about all I can tell you. I had to know that his view was better than mine. When you live as though you truly believe and you trust God, you're saying yes to a wild adventure. Who doesn't want that? Your perspective gives you a better story, but not because the storyline changes, but because you choose to see it through God's lens and not your own. Staying focused on God and positioned on his promises, allowing him to lead you in the direction you're to go is walking in obedience. Throughout scripture, we find many examples of how having the correct perspective and being obedient brings you victory. In 1 Samuel 17, 26, we read David's perspective. David asked the soldier standing nearby, he says, who is this pagan Philistine anyway? How is he allowed to to defy the armies of the living God? Others were looking at it as this undefeatable giant. But what David saw was a very large man who was defying God. And he saw a man he was too big to miss. He knew his position in Christ. He knew that God would be with him. He looked through God's perspective, positioned himself in faith, advanced forward, and guess what? Gained victory. Let's talk about Noah. How do you think Noah felt when God directed his steps to build an ark? Most likely his childhood dream was not to be a zookeeper and build a boat in his front yard. 
But think for a minute everything that was going through his head. He lived in the desert. You're going to do a flood? Okay. You want me to build a boat that's, that's larger than a football field? All right, well, we'll see about this. God directed him, I have to gather two of every animal? God said he was going to wipe out everything, but only save Noah and his family. How are you going to do that? Can you imagine these things that were going through his head? Similar things go through our head when God asks us, do you want me to do what? But when you trust him, you just do it. Noah's decision to stay focused on God and positioned on his promises, did it cost him things? Yeah, it did. It cost him friends. It cost him time. People talked about him behind his back. They gossiped about him. But no one knew that God had a purpose and plan, and that mattered more than what other people thought. It doesn't matter what other people think. Your responsibility is to honor God and to be obedient to him. God will ask you to do things that don't make sense. They don't. Half of my life does not make sense to anybody that I know. But I don't know any other way to live. God isn't concerned with your popularity. He's not concerned with what others say or how they feel about you or your decisions to say yes to him. God is concerned with your obedience and with your heart. When the Lord picked Joshua to lead his people into the promised land, he told him, be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God knew that by Joshua saying yes, he was going to face all kinds of difficulties and challenges. But Joshua had to trust him. If we are to obey and believe God, and we have to believe what he says. Hebrews eleven six 6 to 7, it tells us. And without trusting, it is impossible to please God, for it is necessary for the one who comes to God to believe that he is, that he does exist, that he is a rewarder of those who seek him out. We must not let fear or doubt stop us from stepping out. We must choose to stay focused on God, position ourselves on his word, and step out in faith on the path that he is laying before us. The Apostle Paul, he was a man whose physical eyesight slowly diminished as the years passed, but his spiritual eyesight remained exceptionally clear. During his time preaching the gospel, he was whipped, he was stoned many times. He was shipwrecked, bitten by a snake. He was outcast, he was ridiculed, he was talked bad about y'all. Several times he was in lockdown in one place or another. He was chained to Roman guards. All because he was preaching the gospel. In Philippians 1, 12 to 14, Paul wrote this. In the midst of all of that, he wrote this. Now I want you to know, believers, that what has happened to me, this imprisonment that was meant to stop me, has actually served to advance the spread of the good news regarding salvation. My imprisonment, the cause of Christ, has become common knowledge throughout the whole, a whole praetorian imperial guard and to everyone else. But because of my chains, seeing that I am doing well and that God is accomplishing great things, most of the brothers have renewed confidence in the Lord. People's faith was built up because he chose to follow God and be chained to a guard and put in prison. Paul didn't see himself as stuck in prison because of Jesus. He saw himself stuck for Jesus. He didn't see himself as chained to a Roman guard. He saw the Roman guard as chained to him because guess what? They had to listen to him every single day, talk to God and pray. (laughs) Paul had time to write letters to the churches, something he might not have done if he had been free to travel. God had a purpose for it all. So who put him there? It would appear to most that the Roman soldiers had put him there. But because he chose to look through God's eyes, Paul knew that God put him there. Your perspective changes everything. When you look through your own eyes, the mountains in your life are going to seem huge. When you choose to look at the same mountains through God's eyes, you see just how much bigger God is. It is then you will be able to decree his power over that mountain. You will be able to decree his faithfulness to that mountain. You will stand on his word and cling to his promises. And all of this comes from knowing him, having relationship. Goliath held an entire army captivated by fear. His weapon was intimidation. That is how the enemy operates. He prowls around like a roaring lion, like he's an imposter. 
His roar is not as big as he likes to make it seem. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. His roar, everything shakes. And that's the roar that's within you because Jesus is in you. Your roar in you is bigger than the one the enemy is trying to whisper to you. So tell him to be quiet. We have to live like we are, that we know that we have the authority under heaven and earth, that we are his children. We have to live like it, love like it, give like it, serve like it, pray like it. Not like a little mouse in the corner. God gave us a voice. We need to use it. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. If God is for you, who can be against you? Come on. What did Jesus do when Satan tempted him in the wilderness? He used the word of God like a skilled swordsman. He delivered his blows, citing chapter and verse. Find a couple, memorize them, decree them when something comes at you. We need to quit playing defense and start playing offense. We need to stand. We need to quit letting our circumstances get between us and God and let God get between our circumstances and fix it. He has the will. He knows what to do. We don't. We think we do. We don't. The enemy has tried to get many of you off course. He's tried to chase you away from your promise, your destiny, and inheritance by getting you to focus on you, what you can do through your perspective of things. But it is time for you to stand up and to say no more. I'm done. You are no longer going to have that control in my life, enemy. God is raising you up in perseverance and power. He's strengthening your faith. He's awakening the authority that is within you when you maintain your position in him. I decree right now that you are crossing into your next and you will take more ground for the kingdom than you have ever taken before. Deuteronomy 5.33 states, Stay on the path that the Lord your God has commanded you to follow. Then you will live long and prosperous lives in the land you are to occupy. I encourage you, find those scriptures. Decree them out loud, not in your head, out loud. Everything Jesus did, he spoke. Why should you not be expected to do the same? There's Ephesians 1.17-21, through 21, and this is how I changed it. I pray that the Father of glory, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, would impart to you the riches of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation to know him through your, de your deepening intimacy with him. You change those U's to I's, guys, okay? I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your, under of your imagination, flooding you with light until you experience the full revelation of the hope in which he's calling you to, the wealth of God's glorious inheritance that he finds in you. His holy one. You are his holy one. I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power that is made possible to you through faith. And then your life will be an advertisement of this immense power as it works through him. God loves you. He and wherever you are standing, he is with you. Jer God has great plans for you. Jeremiah 29 11. We know that one, guys. Every day is the start of a new day to start building and to continue to build a relationship with him, a relationship that is built on trust. There's no time lost with God. Today is a new day. It's a new start. If you have been living through your perspective up until this very moment, guess what? You get to start again. No time is lost. You have, it doesn't matter how old you are. God is the giver of all things, including time. You haven't lost anything. You can choose today to start anew. You can choose today to make a change. Will you choose to make 2023 an adventurous year with Jesus at the wheel? If there is anyone within the sound of my voice, all of you and online, that doesn't know Jesus, if there's anyone that knows him, but maybe you've walked away, Maybe you have started to drift back towards those things of the world that seem more enticing than what God has to offer you. And God has called you. Maybe there's somebody that God has called to step into some things, to follow him somewhere. Or maybe you have stepped out of what he's called you to do and you need to step back in because your, pers your perspective has changed. Maybe you've forgotten who you are in him. 
or who he has proven himself to be to you because that can happen. Whether you're in this building or watching online, if you fit any of these descriptions, which in reality should be most of us, I ask that you would stand. If you're online, stand up wherever you are. I ask that you would stand and take a step forward, whether it's up to this altar or it's a step forward in your seat. But as you're doing a, a prophetic demonstration of choosing to come back to him today, of choosing to come back into alignment of where he wants you to be. He has so much for you. Will you stand? Because I want to pray over you. There's a song that says, no turning back won't change my mind. I will follow you, Lord, all the days of my life. The cross is before me and my past is behind. Lord, I will follow you all the days of my life. Will you make that decree with you today? Will you decree it? Will you choose to stand? And you bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you that we can trust you. I thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Father God, for anyone that has fallen back, for anyone that has stepped out of the, stepped back into the boat that you have called them out of, Lord. Father, I ask, Lord, that you would call them again that you would give them that blessed assurance that they can continue to just move forward, Father. Lord, I pray that you would help them to switch their focus from themselves to you, that you would draw them, that they would know that they are loved, they are wanted, they are needed, that they are forgiven, Father, that they will know they haven't lost anything, but they've gained everything by stepping towards you today. Father, I ask that you would put a hedge of protection around them, Father God, and as you take and lead them into some unusual places, through some unusual situations, circumstances, conversations, whatever it may be, Father God, that your voice would be a loud, booming voice, that they would know that it was you. But Lord, they would hear that voice in love. Lord, they would quickly be able to decipher the voice of the enemy and the voice of you, Father God, and they would choose to follow you. Lord, that you would open their spiritual eyes and their spiritual ears to see and hear you better. To see those open doors and hear your voice leading them through it. Lay they be the hinge that changes lives, Father, because of obedience. Father, when they try to step out again instead of stepping in, Father, or they try to go backwards instead of forwards, Lord, would there be a brick wall that stops them, Father? Lord, would you put up that hedge? Would you help to corral them back to you? You would reach out that shepherd's hook. That you would draw them to you. Father God, I pray that they leave our time together today knowing that they matter. That you have amazing things ahead for them and they haven't even begun to see anything. They ain't seen nothing yet, Lord. You have so much more. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, I got two things to say. Uh, one, we should have had Michael sing, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> and, the other, and the other one is, is if that didn't light your fire, your wood's wet. You know, I mean, come on. That was an awesome, awesome job. Good message. Hallelujah. Um, we're uh, going to uh, give Vicki time to pray, but I need to sign off to our online audience here. So um, we want to thank everybody for joining us today, of course, in person and on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. And um, if you'd uh, <clears throat> like to share these uh, videos with anybody, uh, you're welcome to. You can find them at Bayview Christian Center online on Facebook and YouTube. Next, uh, Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., we have um, 
Bible study here where we uh, are discipling, and uh, we are currently in a series called The Gifts of Jesus by Robert Morris, and it's been an awesome, awesome study so far. Uh, Save Savage Sunday Service, I believe, is meeting at Sam and Dave's today in Laporte. Uh, that'll be at 2 p.m. And if you would like to support this ministry financially, you're, uh, you have the opportunity, you can just text the word GIVE to 281-559-6580, and uh, we appreciate it. And uh, we also have a extended ministry that's in Kansas right now. It's called A Word with Amy and AWOL, and they are on YouTube on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m., and I understand they're going to start doing some live stuff. <laughs> okay, so it looks like February. <laughs> <laughs> Because their house is supposed to close on the 30th of January. <laughs> I would know. I'm their realtor. <laughs> so, hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Anything else? Were you blessed? Yes. Amen. Amen. Uh, folks, if you fit any of those categories, and I would say that that's probably most of us, um, please come up for prayer. I mean, it'll change.